Um, Liz is an SFCA Federation of, of uh, Canada. She's had, um, and she has numerous other signature memberships, I might add. You'll just have to go to her website to check that out. She's an elected member of the Oil Painters of America. Um, and she studied with some, some of the greats that, you know, we talk about a lot, like Robert Genn, Kim English, Brian Atteo. And she has a fabulous studio in Canmore and is in several galleries uh, in Alberta and I'm sure elsewhere. Um, she says that light is her constant inspiration and it's play on form. So tonight she's going to be talking about um, paintings that feature examples of great and good composition, design and paint handling. So thank you very much, Liz. I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Sue. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> I wish I could see everyone. Hang on, I'm going gallery view. Okay, oh, no, you're not. <laughs> I can, yes, I am. I just did. Oh, okay, I can, good. I, I overrode you, Kit. Overrode <laughs> you. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thank you for hanging around for the talk. So nice to see everyone. I can't see all 35, but I'm imagining I know some of you and have met some of you through our FCA travels in the past. Um, I. I have what I've put together that I thought because it was a bit tricky to go okay what am I going to do for just an hour and a half because I, I typically teach three to five day workshops. Um, but what I did is I put together um, a very brief talk and then I'm going to uh, give an example of what I talked about with one of my paintings and then I'm going to. Um, show you guys, talk about some concepts of good design and good painting and show you a series of images by uh, paintings by um, very accomplished painters, variety, quite a variety of painters. Um, and we'll talk about why those paintings are successful. And I don't know how you design it, Kit, but at any time, if anyone has a question and wants to ask, like, feel free to just um, come right on in to the middle of the presentation. You don't have to wait for anything, especially when we start looking at paintings, you may have questions or, or comments. And, um, and then um, I think if there's time, so I plan to be here for an hour and a half. Um, and if any of you need to leave early, I will not be offended. So please just <laughs> however you need to go go and um and I, I i may go over an hour and a half but if i do that i i'll check with you guys and see where everyone's at and see if anybody does want to stay on and and maybe we'll get it maybe we'll get it done in the hour and a half too that's i'm shooting for that i, I paired it right down to try and accomplish that end um does anyone have any questions before i launch into the presentation Okay, and um, Kit, I assume you're going to field questions. If people have questions, are they raising their hand or um, how are they doing it? I'll put the chat on on the side of my screen. So um, you guys, if you have a question, you can go ahead just unmute yourself and ask the question. Uh, mm -hmm. But if you don't want to actually break in, if that's just not your thing, you'd rather do it quietly. You can just click on the chat thing, type a message. I'll watch that, and then I can ask the question for you. But, uh, you know, we haven't done that much of that as a chapter. We've mostly just broken right in and asked the question. So, <laughs> okay. Excellent. I, I like intruding. Go for it. All right. Well, let's dive in. So, I think probably the very most essential thing to understand as a painter, whatever your medium is, um, is that you can't paint things. <clears throat> and most um, beginner and intermediate painters, um, that's what they do. They try to paint, me included, when I was starting out, um, I'm going to paint the apple. I'm going to paint the dog. I'm going to paint, uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to paint my sweet niece. I'm going to paint my, um, the, the place where I went on vacation because we had such a good time when we were there. So I want to, I want to paint this photo that I took from when we were there. And, and 
the reason that that gets in the way of good painting is because you can't paint things. You can only paint shapes, attribute a certain value to those shapes, attribute a certain color to those shapes, and handle the edges of those shapes in a, in a number of different ways. Value, shape, color, edges. That is the only thing that you can paint. So whatever you're painting, that's the way you wanna be thinking about it. I look at a photo or I look at a scene in front of me and I'm asking, what shapes interest me here and why? What are the value changes that I'm seeing? And, and how can I push those values, some of the lights darker or some of the darks lighter to try and create more of a cohesive design in my painting? And then um, color and edges, I think are like, it, it's kind of in the learning process of, so I've been painting for, um, I guess 30 years now. In the learning process, I think, the order of difficulty, the th two things that come at the end that are the most difficult to learn are color and edges. Um, actually being able to understand color and color theory is, if you do, it gives you so much to work with in crafting skillful paintings. And then edges, like I was the hardest edge painter in the world for the first 15 years that I painted. Everything, every shape was completely closed and finished. The apple on the table with the banana over here and the tree behind it, each their own shape. That's, that's like I saw independent shapes in, and, and I saw the shape because now, okay, you, can, you, you can't paint things. You also, you don't wanna paint the shape of things. You wanna paint the shape of light and shadow. That is what creates powerful design. And so if you learn to see your paintings in this way and to think about painting in this way, that the subject is everything that happens within the four um, borders of the canvas. It, it's not a thing in the middle <laughs> of the page. The subject is um, the shadow, on the subject as well as the back, the light and shadow as well as the background. It's the entire collection of shapes, including this, the shape between the trees. That's a shape. That's as important as the shape of the tree itself. Every, every inch of the canvas must be considered. Um, and, and so part of the way that I think that it's really helpful to to think about that is um, really understanding how to design with value. So I want to, I want to, I'm going to come in and out of screen shares because I want to, I want to give you guys some visual context for what I'm talking about and then come out again. So um, Kit, is that going to create chaos on your end or shall I just dive in? You should be fine with the screen share. I set it up earlier. Okay. Does anybody have any questions at this point? Nope. Okay. Okay, so can everybody see this? Yes. Yep. Oops. Okay, so so first of all, all design is created with value. That's how you create design. And I'm, by the way, I'm happy to send this along if you guys want the actual, I saw someone maybe trying to take a picture on the computer, which might not turn out very well. I'm happy to send this document for Kit to pass on. Um, so, so you design with value. You turn form with value. And then when you get sophisticated in color, you turn even more form and create even more atmosphere with your how you use color. But for now, we're just sticking, I'm not gonna say much about color tonight. I'm gonna be talking way more about value and design. So this is a bit of a mind bender. When I learned this, which was probably at least 15 years into my painting career, it changed everything for me. And I learned this from Kevin McPherson. I don't know if you guys know who he is. He's a brilliant American painter. 
Kevin McPherson, if you want to look him up. White in shadow is darker than black in light. And black in light is lighter than white in shadow. And here's what we mean by that. So first we take a color photo, which is my yoga mat on my living room floor. And we make it into black and white so that you can see it because color confuses us, right? So if we take the color out, it's easier to see value. So now look over here. Okay, it's not a black yoga mat, but it's darker than the white carpet. So it's a dark yoga mat. Notice that this, this is a beam of sunlight coming in and hitting it, right? It's lying on the floor and this window of sunlight is coming in and hitting it. So notice that this dark thing in light is lighter than this light thing in shadow. Can you guys see that? If you squint down and you compare this shape here, that's the light in shadow with this shape here, which is the dark in light. And can you squint and see, you might need to put your finger like over the whitest white because that can confuse you a bit. But just notice that this, it's white and this is dark, but this is not, um, it is not a lighter value. Does that make sense for everybody? And can you all see it? Because we're going to build on that. So if anyone's confused by that or has a question, please dive in now. Okay, all good. You guys, are, you guys are on it. And so this is how you create sound foundational structure in your paintings. So I, I'm giving you an example with a painting in, in progress. So this is the original photo. Wait, let me make this bigger if I can. Are you guys able to see it canning bigger? Yeah, no, that's good. Okay. That's so here, too big. <clears throat> that's, that's too big? Just slightly, yeah, there we go. Okay, so here's the original photo. Here is the, the value pattern of light and shadow. Can everybody see the translation there? Okay, so it, it, this is one thing that I teach in my workshops that we do like 30 of these where you take a photo and you have a Sharpie and you draw out the shape of the light and shadow and then you blacken the shape of the shadow. And all of a sudden you're like, what just happened? You get this amazing abstract, super strong design because you're not making anything up. You are building on the truth of the subject. So this is, if you took this one practice and just made it a habit to take some of your photos and practice doing this, it's hard at first, but once you, once it clicks, you're like, whoa, and it, it will do so much for your painting. Okay, and then when you start to bring in color, now this is still just a very, the, the first blocking of the painting. This is not a finished painting. I'm going to show you this process with a finished painting, but then as you start to block in color, you've got to keep that structure. So if I, for example, saw this red, um, this red flyer here, if I just think red, I might paint it the same red, the whole thing, right? I, I can't, this looks dark, right? But it's not, it's not dark, it's a very light red. And you can even push it even lighter than it actually is and it'll make the effect even more powerful. Or notice the wall, that's the white wall here in shadow. My brain looks at that and thinks white. It wants to make it light, but my value design says, no, this is the white wall in sunlight. This is the white wall in shadow. So keeping those values right, then when you squint down, it's exactly this, I have not lost this, which is the structure that the whole painting is built on. If you start with that structure, you it's really hard to screw it up as long as you stick to it once you keep painting. Okay. So I'm not I'm not gonna talk about this looking for opportunities to merge shape right now because it's we can go so complex and I want to just give you guys the Cole's notes. So now I'm gonna um, show you this in, I'm going to stop the share because I think I have to to pick the right screen. I'm going to show you this um, in terms of an actual painting that went all the way to completion. Okay. Um, let's see here.
Okay, can everyone see that? Yeah. Okay, so you're able to switch without having to stop the share, but it's lovely seeing your face again. So, <laughs> okay, sometimes when I share and I switch a screen, it wants to stay with the original screen, but I, I'll try oh. that going forward. Okay, okay. Um, so I'm, I'm doing giving you this same teaching one more time here in a, in a more like object related situation where white shirt, black pants. This would be a true value structure. Obviously, we've limited the values way down to the darkest dark, the lightest light, and then the two mid, right? But notice that this is the black pants in light, and this is the white shirt in shadow. And your brain would not think that. Your brain would think, oh, the white shirt wouldn't be any darker than this, and the black pants in sunlight wouldn't be any lighter than this. But if you swap it, it gives you a way more accurate representation of what's there and it gives a solid structure. Okay, so here's the painting um, that um, the finished painting, and then I'll just show you that the cut very Cole's notes steps of this. So, and you can watch in the thumbnails a bit too, because I don't know how else to show it side by side. This was the photo that this painting was done from. So one of the first things that I think about as I look at this photo is what is important? What shapes are important? What is going to make a solid design? And so for me, it was to crop right in here and even take this person out because I don't want, why do I want that person there? I don't need a person sitting there. That's got nothing to do with what I'm trying to say. And what I'm trying to say is, Sure, it's a picture of a guy on a cell phone at a restaurant, but it's a design of light and shadow. So first I crop it in, right? And then I make the value design of light and shadow. Now I know I have a solid painting in the making, as long as I don't deviate uh, when I start to bring color in from the value structure. Of course, when you take this to a painting, you don't just have two values, the darkest dark and the lightest light. You have mid values, but I would highly recommend, if you can, keeping your paintings to no more than five values on a 10 value scale. One of the things that makes a busy, uh, not cohesive painting is too many values both mixing up the values, putting too light of values in the shadows, putting too dark of values in the lights, and too many values. The, this, if you can do it in three values, even better. Okay, so that's the value design. And then this is a, just a black and white photo of the finished painting to show you that how I stayed in the value design. Like if you look at this and you look at this and squint down, right? Like I said, more values. I didn't just use two values. This is probably like a four value painting. And then that's when I, and, and I didn't, like I didn't paint a black and white painting and then paint on top, that's Grise and that was a time honored technique way back when where they would do the actual value painting and then transparent glazes of color over top. But I didn't do that. I went from this to drawing it out and then just checking my values as I went and painting a color painting. Okay. So I'm gonna now show you guys some um, paintings by other people um, that show uh, examples of designing with value. But before I do, comments, questions, you're overwhelmed, all good. What's happening? Are you guys having fun? Are you glad you're here? Is this good? Are you Absolutely. learning stuff? Is, actually, I have a quick question. So that's just a, is that just a small sketch then, that little value initial thing that you do? Oh yeah, it's like, it's like, can you see me? It's about this big. Okay, nice. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And and I might I might do two or three because you, it doesn't always like, oh yeah, awesome. It's like, well, eh, that's not really. And maybe I got my drawing wrong. Maybe I drew the whole leg instead of the piece of leg that was in sun and the piece of leg that was in shadow. Like, for example, 
see, I, I don't draw his legs at all, but your brain wants to draw the leg. So you really, it really, it's hard work to not draw the leg, right? To actually not draw the arm. I, I, I draw this shape that is the shape of the light. Can you show that again? What, what, what would you like me we to show? We can't see it. We see you. Oh, no, I'm, sh I'm doing my whole thing. I, <laughs> I can see the reflection in your glasses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, no. okay. So here, I'm not painting an arm. I'm not painting a hand. I'm not painting a head. I'm painting one shape that is a shape of light. How big is the uh, finished painting, Liz? Nine by 12. Nine by 12. Okay. And this little thumbnail would be a couple of inches? Yeah, three inches, maybe three by four at max. Two by yeah. three, three by four. Yeah. Okay. Liz? Yes. It's Diana. Um, Hi, Diana. How do you decide when you're, how do you get your brain to make the correct distinction? Because it, you just showed us beautiful examples of how we get fooled. How do you get your brain to separate that in the right place? Yeah, practice. Practice, okay. It's just like any other training of your right brain that you do as an artist. Um, we're, we, we live in a world that mostly values and functions in um, left brain um, things. That's how we get through. And so to, to start to train your right side of your brain, and that's a gross left, right. It's not quite yeah. that. But, but you know what I mean? You really have to practice. You have to do things like, have you guys all got the book Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain? Do you know that book, Dr. Betty Edwards, right? So she has a lot of different, actually draw things upside down or, or put, your, put your hand here and, and uh, like tape your paper over here and then draw your hand without ever looking at your paper. Like she's got very various exercises. And the one that I told you of drawing the shape of the light and the shadow, first of all, don't start with a dappled sunlight on trees and shadow on a path. Start with an apple with a light on it and a shadow on the table. Start with stuff that's really simple. Um, I've heard this before about the white and shadow, but you're right, your brain rejects it. Tonight it came okay. very close to accepting it. And maybe if I talk to it a few more times. <laughs> well, I find you have to show it. You have yeah. to show your brain. Well, I'll do my 30. That's awesome. That, <laughs> really, that's the way. Any, any mastery of painting is figure out a skill that I'm weak at and then practice that skill in isolation until I am not weak at it anymore. Okay, now I've got some mastery of that, right? So, and, and all the different skills of painting, that's how you get good because we think, oh, well, I'll just paint a whole bunch of paintings for a whole bunch of years and eventually I'll be a good painter. No, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. It no. doesn't. Because if you don't focus on your weaknesses and spend more of your time on your weaknesses than what you already are doing reasonably well, then you'll just keep moving along with your weaknesses being weak because you're not turning your attention specifically to them to get them caught up to the stuff that you're already doing well. So that's called determined practice. There's a book called uh, The Talent Code. I think Daniel Coyle, it's, it's many years old, but it, it speaks to this. It, he's not talking to art specifically, but he's, he's talking to sports athletes, um, violinists, but determined practice is a, a specific, so how he puts it, okay, I'm going to tell you this, I'm segueing off, but it's, it's really a good, I, I love his um, analogy for it. If, you, if you're going to practice a piece of music, there's two ways that you could go because say you've got a performance coming. You could sit down and you say, I have this piece of music. I'm going to practice for an hour. I'm going to play it all the way through. Then I'm going to play it all the way through again. Then I play it all the way through. And then I practice my piece like five times, right? Check, ready to go. Versus I'm going to play the piece until I make the first mistake. As soon as I make that mistake, I'm going to stop. And I'm just going to play that mistake over and over until it's not a mistake anymore. Then I'm going to go back to the beginning. And if only if I can play through that mistake, will I keep going until I get to, and that is a way more powerful way to move toward mastery of something. Because otherwise you're just repeating mistakes. You're not doing anything about them. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for the great question.
I hear you, sister. <laughs> just like, d just do it until you finally figure it. Okay, I'm going to stop doing that now. But I think we got to show ourselves. Okay, so now let's see here. So how are we doing for time? Okay, we're good. We might get through all of these. Okay. So I am going to show you guys um, some different pictures that are examples of designing with value. Uh, what am I doing? There we go. Can everybody see? Yeah. Okay, we'll start here. And some of the artists I'll know and some of them I won't. So I'll tell you the ones when I do. This is Kim English. Um, so I haven't talked about edges because I'm leaving that till later, but I think I will talk about edges because lost and found edges are what make a strong design and what make an interesting painting. And there are different ways to like, so lost and found edges means a found edge is a very hard edge. And a lost edge is, you, it's gone. There is no edge. Here, right here is um, a, lost, a lost edge. The side of her face into the chair, that's a lost edge. Um, this side of her hand into the chair here. That's a lost edge. Like you don't, there, our brain will fill it in, but there's no edge painted there. They're exactly the same value, right? Um, the edge of her elbow here into the shadow on the chair. That's a lost edge. When you squint down, there is no edge. Um, and so lost and found edges are how you create a cohesive design on the whole canvas. And so value is one way to lose an edge by bringing values very close together. You lose an edge by bringing values farther apart, you get a harder and harder and harder edge. So the hardest edge here is probably this because there's a strong value change there. One of the softest edges is like something right here because, and we can bring in color too, but even if these were different colors, but the same value, that edge would be lost when you squint. Okay. Am I going here? Yes. Okay. I am going to go here. Squint down to see value. Open your eyes to see color. Hmm. And so when you're looking at your subject, that's helpful. But also it, it's what explains why you can make the same value, but two different colors. And if you squint, it'll all look like exactly the same value. Even, but the difference in color will differentiate this is a leg and this is the side of a chair. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm moving on from this slide. Okay, cool. Here's another example. Designing with value. So there's a very clear um, value pattern here. Um, if you, again, to see the value, you got to squint down. Do you guys all know that, right? Anyone not understand what I mean when I say squint? Because again, I, I do remember that we talked about that there might be a quite a broad range of um, how long you've been painting. So if, if I'm losing anyone, please, I'm kind of speaking at an advanced level. So if I'm losing anyone, just ask, ask me questions. But you can see when you squint down, he, he's not painting like every single branch in this bush. It's a big shape that has a certain value. And then some of these little color changes, this violet here and this green here, the color changes are turning the form and turning the, the like turning it in space, but not losing the fundamental value structure of this whole thing. This is in light. Um, okay. Moving on. Oh, this is a really cool one. Um, because it's like, there's so many ways that this painting is connected by values. If you even just look at the black, 
just follow the black. So look at how the top of this vase gets lost in the black table, but you know it's there. Your brain, this makes it way more interesting as a viewer because you have to bring your participation. You have to bring your imagination to find the edge of that vase. And so you're engaged, you're captivated by the painting. You're not just being told this is a vase all the way written around, right? You get to participate. Look at how this black edge of the vase gets lost where it meets this. And then this gets lost in the table. This is connecting. The whole painting is being connected by the vows. This big black band right here coming down into here. The grapes, the value change here. So this is a visual can, 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 oh, I don't know what that is. This is a visual connector all the way through here. And he does it with the white, he, she, I don't know who this artist is, does it with the white as well. Like these, this lost edge right here of this tulip on the plate connects that shape. The shape is this whole white shape all the way into, look at the flowers. Look at all the lost edges on these flowers. They're not outlined flowers, but they have, if you're going to do this and it's going to work, your shapes have to be right, they have to be accurate, and they have to be interesting. But if they're right and accurate, they will be interesting because life is interesting. We make it very uninteresting. We make it very mechanical and orderly and structured and our brain wants to like just sort it out, get it in order, right? It's not orderly. This, it's not orderly in the way our brain wants to make it orderly. Okay. This is Jeremy Lipking. Um, <clears throat> this is such a gorgeous painting. Um, but look at how her brushes value get connect into the paint box. So it's not brushes and a paint box. It's this whole shape. Or how her, um, <clears throat> her skirt just disappears into the background completely, right? So this whole shape here, all the way, that's all one shape, right? It's not a, he didn't draw the line and finish her skirt, which would have been so uninteresting. Um, okay. Liz, can I just ask you who that last painter, what was her name? This is Jeremy Lipking. L-I-P-K-I-N-G. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I could look at this painting forever because it's just so incredible. I'm trying to get this out of the way. Um, there's so much circular movement in this painting that just keeps you, it just keeps you coming back in, coming back in, coming back in. But notice how important value is here. So center of interest, brightest color, strongest value contrast. Um, look at how much the value has been kicked down on this girl and on this man. Uh, the value contrast, right? It's all being brought very, very close together so that they don't call a lot of attention to the eye. Her especially, she's almost the same value here, her, her um, scarf and the water is if you squint down, it, it's almost exactly the same value because the artist doesn't want attention over here. He, he wants all of the attention to come in and this circular motion into this paddle and this drape on the arm. And then th this boat of people back here, look at how the values are so, 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 so subtle. Look at how little value change there is there, right? This is way darker value than that so that that gets pushed way back in and this guy here with his oar so you, the people this brings you into here this circles around to here it just keeps going and going i mean this is brilliant just brilliant design and these circular uh rings in the water as well are part of what reinforce all of that okay this is the the black black in light versus light in shadow. You can see that his collar of his white shirt and his darker than 
the leg of his black pants in sunlight. So there's so many lost edges here. See her feet become the same value as the shadow on the ground. So it's not feet stuck on the ground. The shape is the whole edge of the shadow all the way up here like this. And then look at this beautiful. Then the shape connects back the side of her head, right? So the shape keeps going all the way back to there. It's not a person stuck on the canvas. It is shapes, shapes of light and shadow. Okay. This, uh, this who was that? Darren Thompson, I think. Darren Thompson. This is Jennifer McChristian. How, how does one tell when you've got a finished painting and when it's still just a sketch? Because sometimes I think my underpaintings look more like what you're showing as finished paintings you know you're with your values and everything and you haven't got all the um, edges in and you know you're not worrying about details like someone's foot um so how do you know well it's not that those things what... <laughs> it's not that those things aren't painted it's that they're painted correctly but they're painted they're painted okay. like like for example on this one oops on this one. So see how the edge mm -hmm. of his coat is lost here, right? And the edge of his head, it's, it's, it, that's a lost edge, right? So the shape is right. actually, the shape is this shape of light right here, like yeah. this. <clears throat> that's the shape of the light. If you squint down, she didn't draw a head, right? This is the shape of the light. And then right. this is the shape of the shadow all the way and everything to the left everything to the left is all part of that shape part of that shape does that make sense okay yeah. and then but what she's done as a as a painter as a painting is she's still coming in and doing important details look at the all the many colors i'm sorry this is not okay. high resolution to go big but look at all the different colors and subtle okay. value changes that tell you this is hair and this is the side suggest a line or suggest hair yeah that's right that's right so it 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 it's not just an underpainting okay it's getting it from an underpainting to a finished painting without making a bunch of hard edges and a bunch of broken values that's the hard part that's that's what really skillful painters do Okay. And Liz, when you say not broken values, you're talking about keeping the integrity of the shape and don't start dabbling in there with That's the colors right. that, that cross the line. That's right. You could put as many colors as you want in here, but they have got to stay no darker than the darkest value in the light family. And you can put as many colors as you want in here. Look at all the colors she's got in here. But none of them can be lighter than the lightest value in the dark family. And that's like, that's a whole day in one of my workshops. So I, I don't want to like overwhelm you by throwing it in. But if, if you're far enough along to get what I mean by that. What we do is we go, I'm going to put some blue in here. And we don't consider what value that blue is right? We have to consider what value it is. Because if I put a bright blue in here that is too light, now that's not a shadow anymore. That just became part of the light. Or if I put, um, I, I want to put some violet in the jacket, but if I put a darker violet in there or the red on the bag here, if she goes too dark on that red, she pushes the red into shadow. Because value is what creates light and shadow not color. Okay, as we look at more, it may, because I do find looking at paintings and looking at examples, you just start to kind of get it by just osmosis, by, by seeing it. Doesn't mean you can do it. It, it takes years to, the, painting is one of the hardest things there is to do. Robert Gann used to say, painting is easy. Painting well is hard. <laughs> and I completely agree. Mm -hmm. Like it, it is easy to paint. It is easy to get some paints and slap some paint around, but to paint well, 
it's work. It's, it's going, taking yourself to school and it's doing the practice and it's understanding mm -hmm. what makes a painting good. What, what makes color read as true? What makes design hold together? And then what, what edge quality makes it all interesting? Okay, Norman Rockwell. So even though he was a hard edge painter in part because he was a, an illustrator, um, he lost his edges with value. So just look at this painting and look at the places where he loses an edge by bringing the values close together. And he creates a hard edge by bringing the values far apart. So very intentional hard edge right there. But it's not the shape of just the back. It, you bring in the chair, like you bring in the coat on the chair too. This is the shape, this whole thing. And look, or look at here how this, this is so interesting how he's done this. All these light values here, light, 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 light into the floor here. So that makes this table connected with this scene over here because it isn't a table with a plate on it and a leg and a shoe and a floor. It's shapes of light and shadow. Same here, like the, there's this lost edge right here of the little boy's shirt and that, or this umbrella right here going over to the hat, going over to the coat, going up to the hair, going to here. That's all one shape, like all of this. These guys here too, they're connected by these two shapes. These two guys are connected by these two values being close together because the shape isn't this guy and this guy. The shape is this whole thing like that all the way to there. Does that make sense for everyone? Yeah, okay. This one's just so fun. <laughs> paints this. I know what I'm going to paint. I looked at a brush my teeth this morning. I went, I'm going to paint me today. <laughs> so it's such a good painting. And this is a really cool example of how he used value to connect shapes. Because see here, the value of these bottles on the sink are coming in to the values back here. And by having these values really close together, it allows this whole kind of vignette shape to surround the main subject, but it still connects through with these little hits of dark like this. Yeah, I, I, I have the, 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 the screen bar over here, so I don't know what you, you guys can see. Okay, this is Jill Carver really amazing American artist. And these are, I know everyone thinks they're easels. They're not easels, they're um, boat things for holding boats. I don't know what the proper word is for them, like canoes and things like that sit on them. But anyway, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what they are because look at how incredibly connected all of this dark is back here. It's got some really interesting negative shapes of light but when you squint down this is all this dark is one big shape and it's super interesting shape and super cohesive and then her values here the shadows on the ground and the sh and the legs of these things that are in shadow she's got so many color changes going on in here but the values are in like a two value range. So even though it's a very busy scene, when you squint down, you see big shapes in it, the, the bigger shapes in it. And so that makes it very structurally sound. Okay, that's it for that one. So I'm going to talk about something else now called um, value dominance. But before I do, I want to check in. How's everybody doing? How are we doing? We're going to be fine. We're going to totally be on time. Any questions? Liz, quick question. So what, so practice is obviously key, but what would be your go-to resource for practicing values in color? You know, like really nailing those, like putting value first and foremost, but like getting the colors right. Do you have a resource for that or, or, or a technique or uh, 
Um, yes. Um, so I am a huge believer. So if, if you if you are of the mind, the way that you move to mastery is to break down the different places and work on the ones where you're weak and make them strengths. Um, painting a successful, good painting is like having 16 balls in the air. You, you're juggling a whole bunch of different things. When, so I make a distinction between what I'm painting to paint and what I'm painting to play my scales or do my, do my practice. And if I'm painting to do my practice, I don't want 16 balls in the air. I want to like put most of them down and just like what's two or three balls. That's the most that I can juggle and be stretching myself. And, and like, and, and so if I want to learn to see the value of color, I'm going to start by making it really easy for myself. I'm going to take a photo of something and I'm going to make it into a grayscale. And then I'm going to paint that value structure. And then, because I can see it, there's no color, right? And then once I've done that and I've helped myself understand, um, because when you paint it, you can do it and take, you can do it in a photo and just look at the photo. Oh, now I see. But it's different when you actually then make yourself, even if it's only um, black and white and gray, you make yourself now recreate those values um, accurately. That's a challenge to do. It's one thing to see it. It's another thing to, to paint it. And so then once you've done that, now you say, okay, now I'm going to bring it back into color and I'm going to try and paint it in color. But I know something about value now because I, I, figured, I figured out I have to let my dog out. I figured out how to paint it in the right values. Now, how do I translate that into color? So, and I'm also going to give you a book resource. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> when he barked, I jumped. <laughs> oh no. Well, I've been Even watching. In the background, I knew what was coming, nice but I jumped anyway. <laughs> Oh, is she standing there? Wait, she, no, she was standing she there. I didn't know whether to say you. something to you or not. <laughs> you let me know if I don't figure it's it out. <laughs> she stands, yeah. comes and stands and looks at me. And I might be looking the other way, but she thinks she, I can feel her looking at me. Is that Lily? That's Lily. Who asked that? This, it's uh, Kathy Hale. Hi, Kathy <laughs> Hale. Hi. I'm, I'm showing us the little black box up there, Dooley R.O. I'm good, good. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know all of this. You're I was to... wondering if that was Lily or if Lily was there. <laughs> yes. Kathy um, has taken a workshop from me at my studio in Camor. Yeah, so I want to answer um, Jackson's question about color. <laughs> okay, yeah, dive you in. You teach, it, you, you teach it so well, but the lighter, darker, warmer, cooler... And I can remember being in one of your workshops um, where you said to me, Kathy, is that, so is that the color? And I said, well, it's pretty close. <laughs> and you said, it's not close enough. <laughs> and then you said, so is it lighter or is it darker than the sample? Is it warmer or is it cooler? And you got me there. Yeah. With, yeah. Yeah. Is, yeah. Str like stronger, You're like, uh, more chroma, less chroma, I guess, is the last part of that one, right? And lighter and darker, but. Yeah. And, and like looking... we, it's like, it's so complex. There's a lot, right? You just only yeah. to talk to in an in a evening talk. But you're, yeah, you're, you mentioned something that um, I got from Casey Baugh, who was a protege of Richard Schmidt. And he, I took a workshop with him and he's, I find when you study with a really good painter, if I go study with a really good painter and I get one thing, that thing is with me for the rest of my painting journey. And what I got from Casey Baugh was almost right is wrong. Yeah. And you pass that along to me. Yeah. And, <laughs> I, and I recommend uh, Liz for workshops, by the way, for sure. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I'm actually not teaching workshops anymore. Ah, but I am, since you brought it, let's segue in here, because I was going to say this to you guys at some point. I just got asked by the FCA to do a mentorship program. They're doing these online mentors. So I'm doing a six-week long mentorship program. It's all on Zoom online from February, the last February, the last Wednesday in February. Hang on a sec here. February 20. 
4th through to March 31st, six Wednesday evenings from 6 to 8 Pacific. Oh, that would be awesome to take. Yeah, and that's that's on their website. Too. Yeah, thank and I you. Kit a link. Yeah, um, but so Jackson, how we doing? Did that answer your question? That did. Yeah, that that, that was good. Yeah. Okay, and if you're interested in like really uh, getting solid, solid design skills, one of the best books. You mentioned a book. Yes. Yeah, the book was the only other thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's um, Andrew Loomis. Mm -hmm. Oh, what's it called? Hang on, let me just see. I might have it here and I might not. I go creative, creative design, creative illustration, creative illustration. Andrew Loomis. Okay, thank you. It's a big volume and it's so good. He was an illustrator, um, first and foremost, not a painter, but you need sound illustrative skills to to be a good painter, I, I believe. And, and I heard about him and learned about that book from Kevin McPherson. Okay. Thank you. Uh, what are we doing now? Let me see. Next. Liz, can I, I just did one follow-up question I had was, yeah. uh, somebody asked a question saying that some of the paintings you were showing almost look like underpaintings of some other, of folks paintings. Now, isn't that a matter of style? Isn't that a matter of like, some people like that loose, lost edge style completely. But are you, you're saying every good painting, regardless of style, has to have a variety of edges. Oh yes, it, it, absolutely. If a painting doesn't have a variety of edges, then it's just a, a bunch of separate shapes on the canvas. Yeah. So you can still be what they call, say, a tight painter, uh, you know, a realist. Norman Rockwell. And still, you know, have those lost edges, obviously, that he did through value. He did through value. That's one way to do it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And even if you're a really loose painter, you're still going to use value as well to lose your edges. It, it will be one of the tools that you use for lost edges is bringing values close together. And for okay. finding, finding edges is it, by bringing those values farther apart. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So, okay, you're welcome. Okay, so let's talk about um, value dominance. So I'm gonna share a screen with you again. So I, this is not something that I'm saying you need to do every painting, but it is a really powerful structure to use if it's interesting to you. And so I want to just tell you about the structure and then I want to show you some paintings and have you guys start to guess if you can see it and what it is. Okay, so it's value dominance, which is to arrange your values in a dominant subordinate way, meaning you don't have, let's say you only had three values that you were painting with, you would not give equal weight on the canvas to the light value, the mid value, and the dark value. You would, you would actually specifically divide it to pick one of your values to be the dominant value, meaning it's going to be given the most space in the composition. And then your next one is your secondary value. Your next value is your secondary amount of space, and then you have a smidge of the third value. So you could say dominant dark, secondary light, smidge of the mid, but you could also say dominant mid, secondary dark, smidge of the light, right? Or dominant light, secondary dark, smidge of the, like you can play with this any way you want, right? This is just the first illustration of it, is if you chose that, that segregation of dominance and subordinates. Um, but what, if you do this, it will make your painting interesting always. And so here's just an example of it in an abstract com composition of this particular dominance structure. Dark being dominant, light being mid, and then a smidge of the middle value. Nope, nope. 
nope, nope, that's not what that is. This is dominant dark, secondary middle value, and then a smidge of the light. Okay. And so if this is your range of values here, you ideally do not want to paint a painting with all of these values. When I said maximum of five, like if you picked five values out of here, that's going to give you a way stronger design than if you try to use them all. It also makes it easier to um, hold the structure together. Okay, so now let's look at any questions before we look at some paintings about this. Nope. Okay. Hang on, I'm just getting my windows in the right order. Okay, so I want you guys to participate. So if you're if you're going to say something, just unmute yourself, um, because I want you guys to tell me what you think the dominance patterns are. So for each of these paintings that we're gonna look at, we'll take them one at a time here. I'm actually gonna hide this to not confuse you. So we assume this is a broken down into something. If it, we're only looking for three values, we're looking for dark, light, and mid. What's getting the dominance? What's getting the most of the weight on the canvas? What's getting the secondary amount of weight? And then what's getting just the smidge? So what do you guys think about this one? You got to squint to play this game. Mid is the largest. Yep. Mid, light, and dark. <clears throat> In that order, like you're saying most and then middle and then smidge. Yes, okay. yeah, I would say so. Yeah. yeah. Can, can you guys all see that? Yeah. Yeah. Jennifer McChristian again. She's brilliant at holding her value structures together. Like, she, look how she did not make these windows dark. Right, mm. because then that would have pulled, it would have pulled, broken up the shape, right? Mm. But she wanted this to be all mid up here. And same with when she comes in and does these light things. Look at this guy getting his coat, getting lost in the edge of the, isn't that so cool? Like this, the shape of the shadow, right? Not the, the, the um, shape of the coat and the shape of the door. Um, but yes. Absolutely right. And same here. So look how dark that red is and look how light these reds are. Look at this red, almost as light as this yellow. If you stood on the street and looked at it, you would not see that way. You would think that this red was way darker than this, but she knows what she's doing. She pushes that red light, light, light to keep it in the light. That's a great painting. Isn't it? Who's the, art, who's the artist again, please? Jennifer McChristian, M-C-C-R-I-S-T-I-A-N. Thank you. Yeah, she's a wonderful, wonderful painter. Okay, what about this one? Definitely um, dark. dark. Dark, dark, light, and mid. Light and mid. Light. Yeah. Dark, medium and light. Mm -hmm. Mm, I think it's dark light and mid. Yeah, dark That's light. That's what I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. Although it's definitely a toss up. It could, if you really started trying hard, you could find enough mids. But overall, when you squint down, <clears throat> definitely dark. And then I think there's more light than mid. It's more dominant. It just feels more dominant than the mid. Yeah. Well, it's giving- I think the weight. mid is so close to her dark, it almost fades into the dark part. Well, or here, yeah. look at how the mid is so close to the light, right? Well, yeah, true. Yeah. So maybe she's got four in there, which is what, like two mids? Yeah, but we're looking for the overall, if there's a three value dominance yeah. pattern here, um, you, you right. can see it, right? You don't have to stretch mm -hmm. to see it. I love this painting so much. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... Here is a really important illustration of what we talked about, about keeping, you can use color to tell a whole story, door frame, curtain, 
buildings outside, night sky outside. You can tell use color, but keep the value very, very, very close. The color lets you tell the difference in the story. Keeping the value close lets you keep this powerful structure. Does that make sense to everyone? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So good, huh? So good, I love this painting. Okay, and then they look at this. We can talk for a minute about counterpoint just to throw a curveball in here. Do you guys know what counterpoint is? Maybe, I'm gonna assume you don't all know what counterpoint is. Counterpoint is where you have a, a big shape and a small shape and that one small shape yep. balances the big, huge shape. So there's yep. all this light here and this one little counterpoint of yep. light right there. And that has as much power as this whole mass of white over here, light, because it, it is a, it, it's a triangle that keeps you compositionally. This holds this all together and, and, and includes the background. Yeah. Okay, Bella Madagi. <clears throat> Okay. Kim English. Okay, medium, light, and dark. Yep. Mid, <clears throat> mid light, and dark, yeah. Yeah, everyone see that? Yeah. It's a bit of a toss up between the light and dark. Obviously the mid, he, he, this is a big, this, he does this a lot. Mid, dominant, light, and then dark. That's, you'll find that in so many of his paintings. And you'll always find a value, value dominance pattern of some sort in his paintings. But on this one, I also, so look at all the different color mm. in here, even though it's all mid, right? But the, mm. because the color is the right value to hold this dominant structure. And then look at, this is so cool. I just love how, so first of all, how the, the legs disappear into the big yep. shadow area. So that this all, all of this is part of this whole shape, right? There's not a guy standing on top of the world. He's in the world. And, and then these windows, again, they don't get too dark in those window openings, right? Because what's most important is that they stay in the value structure. And then Look at how he, I don't know if you guys can see when I zoom in like this, if it confuses you, but he did not paint four legs on a mule. Mm -hmm. right. he, just, he just got the shape right. So many lost edges, so many lost edges here. And yet, you know, because the shapes are right, the outline is right. The negative space of light shapes are in the right place. You know, that's a mule. <laughs> this is Edgar Payne, California dead, very famous California painter. Okay, what do you guys think on this one? Ooh. Mostly mid. Mid, dark, and light. <clears throat> well, it's hard mid, to say. Dark and light, I think. Yeah, I think, I think you guys are on it. I think it's mid, dark, and light. Because this green right here is mid is mid yeah yeah it is just the trees the dark trees yeah and the yeah, bright and the only the real bright. light the only real light are just these hits of snow that yeah, are yeah. right at the top where the sun yeah. hits it yeah okay i got another question for you guys about this painting so do you guys know what book, book can, by the way, when I'm screen sharing, can you see me? Because I'm using some hand gestures right now. Yes, we can. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you know what book ending is? Do, do you know? You put something on either side to keep the uh, just... eye from leaving the, the canvas? No, book ending is actually not, not awesome. It's, it's not ideal. Um, so book ending is having something on either side that is equal in shape, right? That it's, it's static. It's not... Yeah. Yeah. Um, interesting no. compositionally. Move. Your eye doesn't move too much. That's right. Your eye gets stuck when you do anything static. So bookending yeah. is actually something to try and avoid. This is got dark trees on the right and dark trees on the left, but it's not bookended. Why? 
because he split up the ones on the left with a bit of water. Um, but it's one, almost bookended. <laughs> no, the ones on the light. right are dark, and the ones light. on the left are medium. There's light in the middle, up high, above the trees. Here? On the, <laughs> no, on the left, it's got that sort of almost like a wisp of smoke drawing your eye back up. Is that right? That's part of it, but whoever just said the thing before the last thing was the closest. Did, any more guesses before the two I lights, the two lights, one in the middle and one on the side of the right, the right side. Okay. And on the top. One is pushed the back. End. One is pushed back a little more. How is that happening that one is pushed back a little more? Well, there's some foreground in front of the trees that I can see, and the other one is quite forward. There's oh, more the value contrast. is darker. Yeah. Who said the thing about value? Who said the thing about value? Gold star student that was coming in. Me. What did you <laughs> Kathy. say? Oh, Kathy, you it's, cheated. You already know. He was, is darker on the right hand side. Mm -hmm. so look at the value <laughs> contrast yeah. here. And look at the value contrast here. Big Way bigger value change here than here. When you squint down, these shapes of these trees do not disappear. When you squint down here, the shapes of these trees disappear. They actually become part of this whole shape. So it's not bookended because it's not trees and trees. It's a big mid value mass and a very strong dark value mass with a very strong mid value mass behind it. So if we think it's trees, it would look like bookending, but if you think of shape that has a certain <clears throat> value, they aren't the same shape. They aren't the same size. They aren't the same height. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that took longer than I thought. <laughs> I threw in a segue and it, it took us, derailed us a bit, but that's okay. We're back. We're back. Okay. Value dominance. Light. Mm -hmm. Light, mid, and much dark. Mid, light, and dark, yeah, I think. No, light, mid, dark. Uh, mid, if the sky is mid, then I'd say it's more mid than light, but it's very well, close. Is the sky mid, mid? mid, light, and dark. Is yeah. the sky mid? What's that? Is the sky mid? I'm not sure. How could you, how could you mm. determine it? Well, I'm squinting and I'm still not sure. <laughs> I'm going to show you two places to squint to help you determine if the sky is mid. Squint right here on this line. Yeah. And squint right here on this line. When you're using your pointer, you talk about lines, but I don't know if on my screen, the pointer isn't always showing what you're talking about. Is this showing you a line right here? Sky is mid. Sky is the mid. Sky is mid. Yeah, the I would say it's mid. mid. Okay, yeah. And now you guys know why you know that, right? Right. Because of the, yeah, because they're juxtaposition. Because when you squint, this line does not disappear, and this is light. When you squint, mm -hmm. this line disappears, and this no. is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. Somebody saying no? No, I don't see it disappearing because I. I no. You don't see Wait. this line disappearing <laughs> when you squint? This one right no. here? No. Yeah, they're, they're close in value. They are. Yes. Can you see yeah. they're close, yeah. can, can you see okay. they're way closer in value than these two? Yes. Mm. Okay. Yes. So yeah. that's that's what I mean by disappearing. I mean, yes, there's still a dip, a slight value difference here, but not nearly as much as here. Oh no, no, no. They're close. Yeah. Yeah. And so that has us determine that the sky is mid, and then there's all of this mid here. So I think whoever you guys said mid, then light, then dark, I would agree. I would concur with that. And, and again, look at all the different colors in this mid, but they're all in the right value. Same here, right. look at all the different colors here, but they're all in the right value that they don't break up the bigger structure when you squint down. Look at what, what happens with these blues when you squint down. 
like they're exactly the same color value as these oranges. It's wild. So there's no broken structure there. It, it holds together. Okay, what do we got next? This is um, Mark Hansen, M-A-R-C Hansen, really incredible plein air mm. painter in the States. So I wanted to bring one in with a lot of color to challenge you guys with the value dominance question. So what do you think on this one? Dark, mid and light for me. Dark. I'm saying mid, mid, dark, mid and dark. Light, yeah. Say what? mid, dark, and light. Yeah, that's what I agree with. Mid, dark, and light. Yeah, yeah, mid, dark, and light. I think it's light, mm -hmm. mid, a light, dark, and mid. That, that sky is the lightest, and it's a large area. Uh uh Look at this. I think the snow <laughs> is the lightest. That one little bright patch. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. When I squint, yeah. Midge of light. This is way lighter than this. Mm -hmm. If we could cut, if we could cut this out and stick it on top of here, yeah, it's like it's way lighter. So whoever said, and by the way, these are games, right? These can be debated. So mm -hmm. I'm not asserting to be right here at all. We're both, and we all have our own way of seeing it. But whoever mm -hmm. said, I agree with whoever said dark mid, and a smidge. Of light because mm -hmm. I see all of this as dark yep. yeah and then I see the mid is the sky and the and the, the orange light. trees yeah yeah the orange is just, probably mid. just this little tiny bit of light yeah beautiful painting huh it is mm. Mm. oh Ooh. <laughs> This is a uh, Dugar Shapov. I'm saying that horribly wrong, I'm sure. A Russian painter, of course, like the best painters in the world. Um, so when you first look up close at this, like it's just chaos of brushwork, right? It's so wild. But then when you squint down, it has a really sound structure to it. You know what it is. Light, mid, and dark. Light, mid, and dark. Okay. Who? Somebody said something quietly there. Mid, light, and dark. Mid, light, and dark. Whoever said, whoever said the first one. Do you want to rethink? Yes. I, I'm, in agreement, I'm in agreement with mid, light, and dark. Yeah. Yes. Awesome. Mid, light, dark. This is not light. This is mid. Yeah. True. Okay. So yeah. that gives you a whole bunch of this that's mid. Really, the only light is it's this. The whole right side, right right right. yeah. This is mid too, right? So yeah. yeah. So mid is the vast bulk of it, and then definitely lots of light, and then just a few, few hits of dark. Cool painting, though, huh? Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. So, so again, right, look at the light, like look at all these values that are reading, all these different colors, but they're all reading as light. And then these, look at all these different colors, but they're all the same value. This violet is exactly the same value as this green and this blue. Okay. Oh, okay, that's it for that. How are we doing for time? Okay. We got one more thing. Oh. How did we miss him? How did we miss him? I want, I want to show you him. I don't know why we missed him. Hang on, I'm just gonna make sure I didn't miss anything else. All the value dominance edges. Okay, that's okay. Let's just look at him. Uh, I know I lost screen share, didn't I? Coming back, coming back, coming back. Here we go. Oh, oh wow. Ooh. Gorgeous. Isn't it? Bill Anton. Is this artist A N T O N? So, shape of the light and shape of the shadow. Um, lots of lost edges to help connect through the side of this horse with the, the rock wall back here. Um, notice 
the difference of value of the snow that's in shadow versus the white on the horse. Even this guy's jacket, right, is way lighter, way lighter than this snow that's in shadow. This is such an important shape too, how he's, see this lost edge right here, mm -hmm. right there? So that's foreground, connects into a middle ground shape that connects into the background shape. So this takes you all the way through. This, he kept the value quite dark of that snow because he didn't want it to start to pop out, pop off of that, that needed to sit back there. But when you look at the incredible color, all the different colors, like, so this is why this is not just a block in painting, right? That the block in might've okay. been, right. Been, but then look at all the musculature of the horse, the, sh the important, all, all these little, I, again, it's not high res, so I can't blow it up really big for you. But even on this pack, that's not just a big shape of light, right? It's got a lot of details that finish the story. And then what I also love about this painting is this sweep, these darks right here, this sweep, counterpoint shape right here, and a big shape. This, all of this points you up right. into the yeah. subject. Yeah. It, it's really a masterful painting. Okay. Yeah. So how are we doing? Okay, I have some uh, slides maybe about eight or nine. Um, on edges. So if everyone's keen to stay, if you need to go, yeah. totally cool. Yeah. We I should only probably be in 10 minutes or so. Yeah? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, let me find it. Oh, bonus material. I wanna show you something right now. First, I'm gonna show you this. And this is an example of uh, we are not talking about color at all tonight, except I will say color has temperature. And when you can see, mm -hmm. or light has color temperature. And when you can see the color temperature of light, you can start to use color to tell your story. So here is um, a picture from my house. Just one morning, I walked out of my bedroom and saw this. Oh, right, yeah. This is a... a Southeast window, this is a Northwest window, and this is the light coming in under the doors. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Isn't that incredible? Wow. Yeah. So if you were painting a rock and you needed to not lose your value uh, structure and the rock was sitting in a bigger mass of rocks but you needed to say this is a rock it's a shape that has form and turns in space if you you could use the same value but make blue on one side of the rock and yellow on the other side of the rock and you would tell the story that one plane of that rock is facing a different direction than the other plane and one is pointing more toward the light and one is falling more into the shadow Okay, back to the edges. Edges. I go, but thanks, Liz. Okay, whoever that is, thank you. Is that Myrna? Yeah. Hi, Myrna. Thanks so Hi. much for, jo for joining. Yeah, thank you very much. It's very, very good. You're welcome. I'm so glad you enjoyed it. Yeah. Bye. Bye bye. Okay, sharing screen. Uh, okay, here we go. So edges. And this is um, mm. wow. Robert Lemler, L-E-M-L-E-R is the name of this artist, American artist. Hang on, I got to get this out of here here Put this here so i can make this a little bit bigger there everyone can see okay yeah incredible huh so without me saying anything you guys can see all the lost edges here right yeah mm -hmm. and it's done with with color and with value but this whole edge of this vase is lost 
Um, and then how that shadow on the wall comes into the shadow on the vase, which is so cool because what that does is it's not a, a vase stuck on a table with a wall behind it. it. It creates, it turns in space. Like it's, everything is connected. E everything is working together in the design. And any place you can create a lost edge, you create a more cohesive structure in your, in your whole, what's happening inside the four boundaries of your canvas. Okay, this is Jennifer McChristian again. So let's just do a little play on value dominance, first of all. What do you guys think for value dominance for this one? Dark and light or? Medium, dark and light. Yeah. I think you guys are on it. Yeah, that, that yeah. makes sense to me. Light. It's a bit of a toss up between the dark and the light, but I think the dark mm -hmm. trumps just a little bit more. But okay, so look at the lost edges and look at the way she's lost them. She would never paint a square outlined window. Like she just <laughs> wouldn't do it, right? So this drag of paint right here to break that edge just makes it more interesting than an architecturally drawn out, perfectly outlined window. Um, but here, look at how the edge of the canoe disappears by value into the background. Or look at how the edge of the um, sawhorse disappears into this shadow, except there's enough of a color change and value change that she's telling you there's a sawhorse there. But if you squint down, it's all, it's all very uh, cohesive, big shape. Same with how the oars, the, they get lost in here. She's got just a bit of it there, but it's almost the same value as this over here. And then strong value contrast right here. She wants your eye to go there. And then for her, like this counterpoint of red right here, this counterpoint of red balances this whole big shape that's over here. And it bounces up and it echoes off that little bit of red that's right there. It's amazing okay. if you cover that with your thumb looking at it, what a difference it makes to the entire painting. To not have this? Yeah, to just cover yeah. up that little yeah. red bit. Yes. And the whole painting just, it, yeah. It, it's so important, right? This counterpoint, yeah. it's like this tiny little thing that is so important. It's just like in music, right? You have counterpoints in music, like the big against small, it balances each other out. You're absolutely right. Like without that, it wouldn't be nearly the same painting. Okay, what happened here? Going the other way. Who's that? This is Mark Hansen again. M-A-R-C, Mark Hansen. But look at how he does not paint the branches on a tree. <laughs> and yet, you know, there's a hundred branches. You know it, right? That's not a big blocky shape. Right. Or the grasses, right? Like he does not paint the blades, every little blade of grass, but you know that's what it is. And then look at how he softens the edges of these uh, telephone poles and, and starts to really bring that value down versus this one, right? So he's creating depth. And no, he put a bird up there. I, I've shown this painting so many times. I never saw the bird until tonight. It's like, hey. <laughs> oh, look at that beautiful violet back there against all these oranges. This is stunning. He's such a good painter. The but warmth he, of the he, snow he, on the right hand side of the road is beautiful. Yeah. What a color. Yeah. And notice this is kind of like a violety, like a, this is purpley violet, bluey violet. This is, a, so this is a cool violet and this is a warm violet. Mm -hmm. Would you guys agree? No. Cool. But they're almost exactly the same value. So, but he made a warm violet and a cool violet, which tells you this is lying flat and this is tipped up. The cooler violet is lying flat. He's changed the direction of form with color temperature, not value. And when you can do that, you can, you can hold the structure of your design together. 
Okay, I might be, I might be whoever got that, yay, that you got it. And I'm sorry if I sometimes I just get off on this. Try to stick with what I'm talking about here. Okay. This is also Jennifer McChristian. This is called Fred in the Shed. Isn't it so good? Oh my God, I love this painting so much. Um, but look at the the value, the shape of the trees and the shape of the shed. It's all one continuous shape, right? Where all these edges are lost. It's not a shed with trees behind it. And there's a lot of lost edges in here in all the stuff that's going on in the workshop too. And what do you guys think about value dominance on this one? Dark, dark light, light, mid. Dark yeah. light. Dark light, mid. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would agree. It's a kind of a toss up between mid and light for the, the yeah. second runner there, obviously dark being the primary. But, you know, I think even if you can get one of them dominant, clearly dominant, even that in itself will start to create a really good solid design in your painting. <laughs> Trump. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, this is uh, an artist called David Shevlino, S-H-E-V-L-I-N-O. I highly recommend Googling his YouTube video, uh, David Shevlino, uh, Sumo Wrestlers. And it's a demo he does of painting something very similar to this. And it is wild to watch him paint. But what he is incredibly skillful at is using edges to create movement on a static surface. Like there's so much movement in this painting and there's so many lost edges. Like look at this guy's leg isn't even painted. And yet you totally know that it's there because like this is so important or this eye socket and this nose and even that the ear they're in the right place if it's the right shape in the right place you don't need a lot of information you need the right shape right place right value and it tells the story yeah i you guys really want to go check out the video like it's it's so wild to watch him paint he's like so ah oh, he's just like into it he's so such a physical painter what's his name again David Shevlino, S-H-E-V-L-I-N-O. Okay. okay, I think this is the my favorite plein air painting I've ever seen. This is Bill Anton. But look at the movement that's created by these lost edges, these soft, soft edges. And then this one perfect, this shape right here is just, it's everything like it makes the, it, it gives a structure. If it was all just like wave foam and waves, but this gives depth and pattern and rhythm to it. Mm. And again, this value here and this value here are almost identical, but they're totally different colors. Oh, this is Quang nice. Quang Ho, uh, also very well-known American painter but it's pretty wild how like what a dog's breakfast this is and yet when you squint down it's so totally obvious what it is so many lost edges mm. and yet like so this lost edge right here but look at even this streak right here that tells you there's like a doorway or something back there Right, like this is not just paintings like this. If you don't, if you if you don't understand what the artist was doing, can look like they just slapped a bunch of paint on and they got lucky, right? Yeah. This is not luck. This is profound skill and understanding of of what he's doing for this to actually turn out. But look at their ears. Mm -hmm. Look at their ears. So good. <clears throat> Okay, this is, oh, don't, I don't want to forget his name. I used to love this guy so much. What is his name? Edges. Giano. Vince Giano. That's what it is. Giano. G. G I A. G. 
I'm going to find it and send it to you guys. I feel terrible. I don't remember his name. I love his work. But okay, so check this out, right? First of all, look at all the ways that this whole dark mass is connected by these values being close together, right? Like this connects into here. So it's, it's a very cohesive painting. Here's one of the things that I think is the coolest. So we're talking a counterpoint again here. Can you guys see this red dot right here? Oh, wow, oh, yeah. Keep fake. He's also got a whole doorway back there, but he's got that red dot right there and this red here, counterpoint. And then this red right here. So he's got, he's got you, right? You're not getting out of this painting. But even look at how he painted the numbers on the, like it totally looks like that would look and there's not, he didn't write letters and numbers at all, right? He just made the right shapes in the right sizes. Okay. Oh, I wanted to show you one more Mark Hansen because this to me is like such an incredible example of form without detail. You don't need the detail if you get the form and the value right you know these are winter trees, leafless winter trees, you know it. And you, you know there's a bunch of branches, you don't need to see them. And then look at what he does with the values as he gets farther back and the color temperatures. Way warm against cool here, a little bit less warm, little bit less of a change in color temperature. And then here the color temperature comes almost to exactly the same color temperature. Meaning these are way cooler. If you cut this out and stuck it on top of here, way cooler. Way, wow. so he's pushing, pushing them back by doing that. And such restraint on chroma, hey? Yeah. Again, it's so beautiful, it's so subtle, but strong. Yeah. This is Kim English again. Oh, neat. I, I just am floored by how he could paint these paintings on a wall so like wonky and loose and yet it totally reads like some paintings hanging on a... Hmm. To be able to not do get out the ruler, <laughs> right? To be able to do it so loosely and abstractly and make it work. And then he does these beautiful washes. So whoever was asking about underpaintings, like his big mass areas in his paintings are underpainting. But he, he, he's intentional in the very beginning about changing the color temperature as he moves out, making sure there's lots of good color variety so that he doesn't actually have to go back in and do anything later. And then he just turns his attention to the thicker paint just on the important details. And what do you guys think about value dominance on this one? Oh, mid, 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 light, dark. Light and dark. Yeah. I'm thinking mid, dark, light. Dark and light. Yeah, yeah. mid, dark, light. Because there's a lot, quite a few yeah. darks in here, huh? And there's a lot of light, 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 light. The, back. the only light lights are the window and this frame. And this piece and of that frame. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, the frames in the mid, middle of the wall, closest to you, is really light. These, yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think the only lights in this painting are this light around here, this one mm -hmm. piece here, then this piece of door and this window. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, that might be, oh, one more. Look at this one! So fun! Isn't this so fun? So this is a lot of just raw underpainting here. Almost nothing. Like, I'm guessing this was plein air, and I'm guessing it was done fairly quickly. But look at how thick, 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 thick. So these beautiful transparent passages against big, thick, opaque. That is such a cool way to create interest uh, on your painting surface. But the values here, like the value of these violet shadows is exactly the same value as this here, but a different color temperature telling a different part of the story. And then like, just look how little suggestion here and you know that's a bunch of trunks of trees back there. 
And then that, this, this is not a value change, but it's a color change, which tells you these grasses are in light and these grasses are in shadow by the color change. Okay, that's it. That's it. Okay, stopping share. <laughs> okay, we got through them all, you guys. <laughs> wow. Any questions? Anything you guys want to ask or say or know? Well, just before that we get on great. to anything else, I've got one question that's come up on the chat. So let me get rid of that one. Um, he says, before you end, can you ask Liz if her course will be listed on the National FCA website or the chapter website? And the answer to that, of course, would be the FCA website. I think that's where the FCA Academy thing lives. Yeah. But I can send you a link kit if you want to send it to the peeps. Sure. If they just to, made it, um, they just made it live today. I checked and it is live now. Yeah. So. If they start at if if people start at the FCA website, which is simply artists.ca, mm -hmm. then you can click on you know education, which will take you to the FCA Academy uh, site, and that'll list all the all the courses right there. Wait, here's what I'm doing. I'm going to put it in the chat right, right now. Oh, perfect. There it is. There we go. There's the perfect. link. Oh, Zoom. How did we ever live without you? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Questions, comments, anything? How are you doing? I just want to say it makes me want to go back and paint over everything. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Like just, oh, don't do you know, it, Michelle. Don't do it. Don't, do it. don't do it. Burn that shit down and start new. <laughs> <laughs> Always go forward. Go forward yeah. with your painting, not back. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Yes, quick, quick question, Liz. So um, you, you talked about, again, great point, working on your weaknesses, right? Uh, throughout your painting journey, what, what do you find was one of your... Uh, Weaknesses that made it such like a really significant change for you in your work. When it was no longer a weakness. Yeah, like what, something that you yeah, went, was, really went, wow, this is unreal. Yeah, um, the thing what I just shared with you guys about value, about designing with value, <clears throat> about learning to see the shape of light and shadow over the shape of things, and then right. losing losing those edges. That, that changed everything. Wow. And when I say losing the edges, I mean losing the edges by I'm not painting a leg and a table. I'm painting the shape of the shadow and the shape of the light, which then loses the shape of the leg. Yeah. And then trusting, trusting that the, the viewer is going to get it. They're going to know that's a leg, even though I did not paint the edge of that leg. And not only are they going to know it, they're going to be so grateful for me that they got to find it for themselves instead of me saying, you sit there while I tell you what you're looking at. Like you, it, it, you invite the viewer to participate in the painting. Th those, those are the paintings that are, so that, that was, that's the biggest one right there. Absolutely. And it, and it took a lot of work. It wasn't like just all of a sudden, Oh, why didn't I know that before? Let me start doing that. It's like, Oh, Okay, how am I going to get good at that? Lots of practice. Yeah. One thing I noticed is that uh, even though we focused on on value and color, uh, composition is also I noticed in all of those paintings that you know I always say start with a composition and then probably you know I, I look at those other things shapes, light, and value. Yeah. Well, to me, composition is created by your pattern of value. Shape and value. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Is there Diana, any other question? Do you have a question? Um, I, a couple of things. How, what is the format of your mentorship going to be like? Is it just going to be critiquing paintings or will you be setting us challenges? Yeah, it, there won't be that much critiquing of painting. What I'm thinking is it's going to be like, it'll, it'll be a way more complex take on this, but this will be a big 
part of what it, it's built on. Yeah. And it'll be exercises, like specific exercises that you'll go away and do. And then when you come back, we'll look at them and we'll talk about what you learned <laughs> and what you figured out. And then of course, there will be room for if people want to bring paintings for critiquing, but it's not like, like I'm not gonna, if yeah. say, let's say there's 10 students, I'm not gonna, over the course of the six weeks, critique 10 paintings by each student. It's it's not yeah. for critiquing. It's actually for working on your weaknesses. It's That's like, what I want to do. Yes. Um, Liz, I, you know Ian Roberts, right? Just finished, um, well, I'm still connected, but he did some amazing online stuff. And I learned so much but the drawing, the composition course is over, the painting course is over, and you are exactly the next step. I, I am, you've put some of what I learned from him into perspective, and you've pulled me further forward. Thank you. This has been amazing. You are so welcome, and I'm I'm so glad you had that experience. Oh, I, and I can't wait for you to shut up so I can go and sign up for your course. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I think Jackson's got a few words to say. Me, yeah. So, you know, Liz, uh, further to Diana, they, I couldn't think of a better speaker and presentation to get us inspired here oh. with the new year. Seriously, uh, yeah. that just so insightful. Uh, we're so grateful for your experience and, and just amazing. Like like Diana says, I, I cannot wait to go painting tomorrow. So oh, thank yay. you. My work here is done. Yeah, <laughs> thank you awesome. for this. And uh, yeah, we're gonna <laughs> sign up for your class. I'm sure you'll see a few, few, few of our faces again. So awesome. thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you, thank, thank you, Liz. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. You are so welcome. Thank you all for coming. And thank you all for staying for the, the whole duration. And I'm so glad that you enjoyed it. Loved it. That was awesome. Thanks. Fabulous. Really, 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 really.